yeah, like, noted, Jonathan. Um, definitely, we'll be doing that. Um, <clears throat> okay, so I'm going to share my screen so, uh, so we can all be on the same page. Haha, <laughs> lols, literally. Okay. <clears throat> Just making sure every Bill Keys, I, I can be heard. Yes, we can hear you. Okay, cool. So I'm going to start this again. Hello and welcome to the second session of Design Thinking Think Shop. Uh, in particular, this is directed at the Google Developer Students Club, but those who are participating in whatever um, position or from whatever space, welcome. Um, we'll be having a look at the design thinking process, drawing on from our first session, um, but also going a bit deeper and potentially having a look at, um, not even potentially, we will be having a look at a response from um, a group that had already gone through this process and documented their findings. Um, so welcome back. <clears throat> the plan for today <clears throat> is to apply your thoughts and thinking to your um, applications that you'll be making, um, drawing on or looking at the challenge that has been presented with you and potentially using the design thinking as a mechanism to improve or to equip or to assist in your um, design process. Um, I did groups and breakout sessions initially. I've not removed it. This was the plan to, for, uh, to work through in groups the tasks that you've, um, been, uh, that you've been given and using the breakout sessions to continue those conversations. Now, noting the timing that we had in the first session and the types of engagement, um, I think I would want to pause that process there, but rather for you to draw on the group that you were in and to think about um, the situation or the challenge that was presented to you. So if you were dealing with the um, the walk or running trail, or if you were doing dealing with the insect farming, which I don't think anyone was, or if you were dealing with the, just trying to think of the others now, with the COVID-19 or disaster response or, or news response um, application. Um, to think of those um, as challenges, if you're not uh, engaging with it immediately, if it's not your actual project that you're dealing with outside of the space, or if you'd like to apply this to your actual projects, I think that can happen as well. So the group work or the breakout sessions won't necessarily happen, um, just wanting to be ready of time. Um, but I do encourage and I do invite you to really think through this process and try to apply it to your own projects, whether it's the ones that you've been given in the first session or the projects that you're dealing with um, that's a part of your challenge um, that you've been given by your committee or, or your um, society. Um, in terms of the timing, there's just a 10 minute introduction. I will be engaging with content. The activity time by number three will um, be somewhat non-existent, but I do encourage and I would love if there were questions to, if not, if not mute, unmuting yourself and asking that question to type it in the text box and either Bill Keys will notify me or alert me that there is a question um, or if I see it, I will um, address it immediately um, if it's appropriate at that time. If it, will be, if it can be moved to maybe the next section because it's appropriate then, I will do so. Right, I also just want to say, before we do the recap, um, and this is just based off the questions that were asked in the first um, section or first session, was just the importance of interviews. And we'll go through that in this session. 
um, but also not to be attached to the final solutions. And I think that will hopefully come out through this process, but usually what happens, and, and this is based probably human error or, or human ways, is that when we start the process, we already have our end product in mind, what it looks like, what it feels like, how it's going to function, what it's going to do. Um, and that will be, that will, that will be somewhat of a crutch or it won't be a really good thing to have in your head because everything you'll be designing will, to, will be to fit that final product. What is advised is that you let go of that, final, that idea of the final solution, what it looks like, what it feels like, and to be with the process and to trust the process because best believe what you've thought about at the beginning stages of this process um, of the design will definitely not be that end product, that end, uh, even though it will meet the end goal. And this is something that Bill Keese had said, um, and not to put you on the spot here, but it was to fail fast. The more you are embedded and with this process, and the more you fail, the greater your chances of success at the end. Because every time you fail, the design thinking process allows you and encourages you to go back and to be able to address those failures, those inadequacies, those oversights. Um, and so you can't do that if you have that final product in mind already, um, because everything you'll be doing in this whole process will be to suit that final product. And also the question is, well, who is this product trying to uh, appease or please? Is it me as the designer or is it the person who's going to be using whatever service or whatever product that is? And in this case, the applications, your, your applications, your apps. Um, so we'll be doing a, a recap. Um, and then also just noting, um, Jonathan did post a feedback form Feedback would be really wonderful. I mean, if you think about it, this is a process as well that we're going through. And that feedback is essentially me wanting to, and, and the committee wanting to know, was this worthwhile? This product being given to you, is it worth something? Are you getting anything of it from it? Is there any uh, recommendations that you, that you could suggest that we could improve on this particular platform and through this engagement? So, for those of you who are not with us in, this, in the first session, and for those of you who, whom I did not speak to, because I was um, politely called out by Bill Keith again, stating that there was a group that did know, not know about the scenario, even though I had said everyone did know. Um, I do apologize for that, and to Bill Keith, I apologize as well. Um, you were correct, I was not. Um, the scenario was as follows, and this is just to get us to think about it again and to, to draw on how people responded. And think of it in your, own, in your own mind. If you were alone in a dark cavern and there is a zombie horde, a grouping of zombies that had just passed through the woods and your cabin was based in this woods and it's dark and it's at night. With only one match, and a lamp, a fireplace, and a candle to choose from, which would you light first? So you're in a cabin, it's dark, you probably, you know, you ran from your home, let's just give some, 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 um, some context to this. It's Armageddon, it's apocalypse, it's the end of the world. Um, you've just um, ran from your home, <clears throat> you're escaping zombies, you find this cabin, and um, you're hiding and the zombie horde follows you, but it passes through and it's getting cold and you're needing to light something to heat up. Do you, with this one match that you have, do you light up a lamp, a fireplace or a candle? Which one do you do first and why? Now, without anyone responding, I think some of you are maybe thinking about how how you others responded in your smaller groups some would have said 
lighting the lamp because that's your immediate source um, of maybe light. A candle might be too, too dark. A fireplace might be too bright. Some would say light the candle that then lights the lamp that then lights the fireplace. So you have all of this light. Some are saying don't light anything because they're zombies. And so um, any light or any heat attracts zombies and you'll be put in danger. So should we even light anything to begin with? Now, there's no correct answer to this. There is no correct answer to this. Um, the process was to uh, the process was that we see how people respond and where do they come from um, and what is the rationale what is the thinking behind their approach to this particular response or this particular scenario and that should just make us aware and sometimes you know we would have one response and others are obviously different have would have different responses and it's just for us to be aware that if there is a situation, whatever that situation is, however people are positioned in relation to that situation, they will respond how they feel they need to, how they feel comfortable, how they feel necessary. And so it's to note that there is a variety of responses. But not only that, but that there's a variety of experiences. And so to move through, the, for us to be aware of that and to move through the process now. So this again is a recap and we'll uh, go through this briefly because I want to go to those deeper questions that are asked. Now the process is as follows. Empathize, define point of view, which is POV, ideate, creating space for making ideas, prototype, and then test. That, um, those are the five steps. Now, empathize, empathizing with the peoples you are engaging with can be broken up into understanding and observe. But what should come out of this diagram is the nature of these lines and is the nature of iteration. That wherever you are on this process, you can definitely jump back and then restart that process. So if you're in your prototyping, you can definitely go to observation and then move through again. If you are stuck in ideation, go back to the understanding and then move through. Sometimes you might be in the testing phase and you're testing with the people and it requires you to go back and redefine your point of view, who is centered in your project or in your application. So going through the, specif the specifics briefly, for us, we're searching for rich stories and to find some level of love. We are wanting to learn about the audience for whom we are designing by observation and interviews. We're looking at what they're saying, what they're thinking, what they're doing, and what they're feeling. And all of those four aspects, it's through interviews. And I can't stress enough the importance of the interview. Interviews takes up the bulk of this process. You cannot base it on five people or even 10 people. I mean, if you think 10 people are, is enough data to use to base your project on, fine. But usually, you, you, um, you try to get as much interview sessions as possible, speak to as many peoples, and get as many anecdotes, stories, experiences as possible. Because the greater the variety of experiences and stories and anecdotes, the more you have to work with to start your uh, defining your point of view. Now we're looking for when we are when we are empathizing and when we are looking for the emotion, the experiences, why people are drawn to doing certain things, what gives them power, what takes away power, what makes them feel certain things when engaging with a product or service. That is what we're looking for. 
And we're interested through the uh, empathize um, stage, we're interested in who is the user, number one, and what matters to this person. What are the, and, and as an interviewer, speaking to the interviewee, you need to be open and to receive, to take in what they're saying. Be conscious of what they're thinking when they're saying these things. Be aware of how their body responds when they're saying certain things. And also be, to be conscious of their emotions that's associated with what they're saying and what they're feeling and how, what they're doing. We're wanting to gain the understanding of the challenge, the relevant topics and stakeholders, and that particular part will be broken up um, later on. And then also observing uh, or understanding the needs, struggles, and potentials of users and stakeholders. That will be broken up as well. We speak to, we'll be speaking to that later on. Also, before I continue, if there are any questions, you're more than welcome to ask. If I'm speaking too fast, which I tend to do sometimes, um, please just make me aware of that and I can slow down um, so that everyone is with me as we're going through this process. Moving on to stage two, the define. <clears throat> now, in the define phase, we are now taking all of those experiences that we've explored, um, all those an an sorry, anecdotes that we've written down through our interviews. So it's as if we've opened up ourselves to be able to, we've casted a wide net to see what anecdotes we can get. And now we're reeling in this net, we're bringing it in, and we're wanting to sift through all of those anecdotes to be able to come up or to define a point of view and to be as specific as possible. That point of view will be the centerpiece for us moving forward in the, uh, in the design stages. Who is this person we're thinking about all the time when we are designing? And when I say who, I speak of a specific person. So if it's Khadija, if it's Michael, if it's um, whoever you're wanting to, to think about, who is this person? But it's not just Khadija and Michael, um, it's the stories that they bring with that. We're, so we're synthesizing the information and defining unique problem uh, focus and defining un the unique problem focus from the user's perspective. So if Okuche, for some reason, is interested in um, sound engineering, and we're wanting to create an app for that, which this is actually a friend of mine, uh, who does exist. Um, how do we, and we're wanting to, and he has needs, you know, being on the go, rather instead of using a laptop, using a phone to be able to either take in sounds or to document sounds or to be able to bring sounds together and synthesize and whatever sound engineers do, um, in, you know, in the music uh, sphere, um, what are his needs and how, is, how am I thinking of him all the time when I am now, creating this platform for him to use. So we create a point of view that is based on the user's needs and their insights. And we're always asking the question, well, what are Okukhle's needs? What is Khadija's needs? What is Michael's needs? What are their needs? Because we know they have certain insights and they find themselves in a particular situation. Now in order to, <coughs> To um, see how we can address this issue, we ideate. So we come up with ideas, 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 we brainstorm and come up with as many possible solutions. And as I said in the first session, that your own imagination will set your limits to what these ideas can be. Um, and we do this, not only do we think of the ideas, but we draw them, we document them. So that can either be doodling, drawing little stick figures, um, put them on pieces of paper, materialize them 
so that you have something to work with. Um, and we, this process always encourages wild ideas. It can be far-fetched, it can be something extreme, do it. Go to the far ends and then work your way back. And you're always asking the question here, what could possibly or even impossibly be done? And this is usually a fun part, especially people who are creative or people who are not creative. It really puts you in an interesting position for you to just do and, and create whatever that is. Now, from those ideas, you're usually thinking about a handful of ideas that are worthwhile to invest a bit more time and for you to then prototype it. So here with the prototype phase or stage, we build to learn. So we're wanting to build a representation of one or more of those ideas so that we can show others. And those others are usually the peoples that we've interviewed, that we've engaged with before, that we've connected with and are aware of what we are intending to do. So I will go back to Khadija, go back to Michael, go back to Kukhle and say, this is what I've created, what are your thoughts? But that's before, um, but before we do that, we're wanting to show what this idea is. And so this prototype is a, just a draft. It doesn't have to be neat. It doesn't have to be something that, is, um, that has everything together, that works, that's functional. Um, and one thing here, and, and since global warming is a thing, and so we're quite aware, of, just like side note, social justice issue, um, we're quite aware of, of just resources and the overconsumption of resources and, and the misuse and, and of paper and so forth. Um, a pen and paper works fine to be able to, to, to document your idea and to present it to someone. If you don't like that, you can do a digital version. Keynote and Prot are two uh, online websites that you can use. You can even draw a storyboard. Like if you think people who create movies and sitcoms, um, they usually have a storyboard as to what happens um, throughout the duration of the movie or whatever that, whatever that is, uh, and what happens with the figures. Or even you can act it out. You can use your body in order to bring your idea across with props, with whatever. Um, it's drawing on the creativity in the ideation um, stage, but now defining that creativity and with a specific intention of, to be, of being able to present your idea and to put it forward to others, to show everyone else. And the last stage, of a five-stage process is the show, don't tell. Now here we're wanting to test with others and it needs to be stressed. And some people are quite, um, you know, when you create something, it's like your baby, it's your creation, it, it can't do any wrong. Here, we're wanting to reframe from doing any of that to say, I've created something, I'm wanting to test it, I'm putting it out into the world. What I'm, the reason why I'm doing this is so that I can get feedback. And that feedback is important for you to now further your development process, further your design process, further refine what you've done, further, um, to, fur yeah, to just to further that process um, so that it meets the direct needs of peoples. And so when you're sharing your prototype with um, the original user for feedback, or when you're going to your peoples that you've, um, that you've um, interviewed, um, and even when you've, during that interview process, you can say, you can ask, can I, once I've you know, created my prototype, can I test it with you again? Just so that you have people's consent. And so you don't say, hey, remember the time I spoke to you? Look what I created. Now work it or do something with it. Um, so you want to be also just be aware and create an uh, amicable relationship with your interviewees. When we are testing, we're looking, we're asking for questions, either to ourselves or we're allowing those questions to be answered by the interviewee. We want them to see what worked. And you need to document this. What worked? 
not only what worked, what didn't work. You can't just put it to the sideline, you know, push it to the side. You need to document and you need to name what didn't work in your prototype during the testing phase. You need to also see if there are any questions that are asked by the interviewee, or if you see something uh, happening in the exchange between your prototype and the interviewee, you can even ask, oh, why did you do this? Or what was interesting there? Bring the questions forward, but also be aware and document what questions are being asked by the, the interviewee. What are they noticing that you haven't noticed during your process? What are they bringing to the surface? Um, what's something that you might not have even thought of? Sometimes they might even they have, have the questions. They might even go further to give you an idea or even ideas. And so they might ask, oh, why did this happen? You know, what you could have done is this. When that happens, pick it up, document it, take it, and then and, and go with it. Because those ideas are giving you more insight into that process, more um, insight into the into the the person's experience. There is a question. Sorry, Ibrahim. Uh, just, uh, I once attended a, a design thinking course at, at GCT. It was held at, at the at the graduate school in. in yes. In, yeah. Were you part of that? Of that, or is it? Because uh, I see similar concepts here. We were part, so we were part of that. This is oh, so for those of you are, who are um, joining us, so this is D school. This is design. This is from the Design Thinking School. Oh, okay, okay. no, yeah, it's fine. So then, because I see the concept there are, are, are similar. So I was just thinking because I missed the morning session, so I was just uh, like uh, uh, wanted to know what was covered in the first section. So I, I think I'm familiar with the stuff that you're saying now, but it's it's okay. You can continue. Okay, no, no, thank you for that. And sorry, apologies, I should have mentioned, this is all based from the Design Thinking School. So the, so D School, the School of Design, is an international school, it's an international concept, and there are many um, D schools, smaller schools, so to say, in different countries. And so they all follow the same uh, five-step process. However, depending on the context, whatever happens under those process of steps or stages will be different. Um, and so thank you for that. And, uh, and if you're wanting to go further into the five-step process, definitely Bill Kiss or I or, uh, will be able to share the D-School um, bootleg information because um, there's a lot of content out there um, that deals with, firstly, there's a lot of content that deals with design. Um, oh, sorry. Because of, pardon me. I want to ask another thing. Uh, when I, I did, I did it. Uh, I think it was two years back. Uh, uh, I wasn't able to finish the course because uh, uh, I think I was uh, like I was doing my um, master's part time and also working full time. Are we gonna get certificates if we participate fully for this? That is something um, Jonathan or Bill Keys or the powers that be will be able to respond to. Um, I'm coming. Have, the uh, thing is, I've just submitted my thesis in January, and I don't know if if I'm completing it. Can it be added on my on my academic record that uh, I did it as part of my studies at GCT? Because it, it's also being marked. The dissertation is being marked at the moment. I'm just waiting for my results. Is this your participation within the D school at GCT? Is this the question that you're asking? I'm saying if I do participate in this, uh, like in this DSC course now, will it be able to reflect on my academic, on the transcript that I'm going to receive later this year? I, I would not know. I am not a part of the admissions at UCT, so I don't know what that process would be like. Okay, okay. thanks. Thanks a lot. No, cool. I mean, but definitely find out because, and yeah, because, yeah, if you're speaking specifically about this school, it's an amazing process, it's an amazing experience, it's really wonderful to meet amazing people, and it's also really interesting content that you are exposed to, which I'm hoping to bring across here.
No, it's just um, that I, I wanted to know if, like, I mean, if it, if we can, like, when you have a CV and and, and it's reflecting, I think it, it's quite attractive towards maybe potential employers. So, I don't know. No, completely. No, yeah. completely. And so I would invite you to 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 explore and find out if that if that could potentially happen. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Um, thanks. No, thank you for the question. Thank you. Um, and and the clarity as well. Um, so the last part is this iteration of this process. And so we've gone through those five steps and it allows you to go back and to see um, where you can improve, where you need to respond, where you need to um, engage a bit more, where you need to investigate a bit more. Um, and before I start with the, the second part, is there, are there any other questions or if there's any, um, or anything that needs to be said at this moment in time. Um, nope, we're good. Again, if you have any questions, you're more than welcome to unmute yourself and ask. Um, and then also, if you prefer not to do that, you can ask in the, in the, um, in the chat box. So moving on to part two. So here we want to go a bit deeper into what is being asked. Um, I just want to make note that you'll see on top, it will have a number and, and these are the initial groups that you were part of. For now, you can maybe go back to what those groups were or this particular situation and ask yourself, well, what, how do I answer the question in relation to this particular scenario on top? Uh, initially, I would have wanted people from those groups to go back into the groups, um, discuss even further, and then come back and then try to answer these questions. But considering time, I think my main objective right now is to hand over these questions for you to have something to work with and then to be able to um, do it comfortably in your own time. So if we go down to the bottom, we see the empathize, oh, I, is that bar in, in, yeah, there we are. We see the empathize stage. So now we're going to go back to empathize and we're going to see what is really required of us when we want to engage with this stage or this, this particular part. So here we're wanting to understand the project challenge. Um, I see there's a question. I'm just going to, ah, okay, cool. Uh, Bill Keese has just um, given the breakdown of those um, particular um, thought experiments that we wanted to do, the different groups and groupings that we were in. So you can have, an, you can go to them and think maybe, you know, how would I answer this question here? So with the empathize stage, we're wanting to gain an understanding of the challenge, relevant topics, and stakeholders. So here we're wanting to understand the project challenge. What is the issue? What is this challenge? What are we wanting to do? What are we needing to do? And in this italics, you'll see that I've added some content. Initially, it was not there, but I decided to just give, um, well, we decided um, to just give a, an example of what could be done uh, or how this could be answered. And this has nothing to do with, um, with designing applications. And so here for this particular challenge, and this was based on a group, an actual group that did this. Um, so we thank them for their work uh, to be able to use here. Um, for this particular challenge, they were needing to design a way for the center for, uh, extended childcare development to extend the ex uh, this extended childcare development into the home environment. So initially, this childcare development was based at a center, but because of whatever reason, they needed to, they wanted to extend it into the home environment. And in particular, in a world where the first thousand days of children play a major role in the child's development. Now, you will go to the text box and see um, 
scenarios where you have um, a walking or running trail application, you know, um, disaster reliable news platform, e-learning platform, student productivity, dealing with South African police service, online arts gallery, and here we have childcare development. Um, and this was used, this process was used to further this goal. So that was the challenge, to extend this learning process into the home environment, from the center to the home. So we're wanting to ask, what is the challenge? So in any of your projects, what is the challenge you're wanting to address? Not only do we need to understand the challenge, but also to understand the team you're working with. So I'm not, I'm unaware of the nature of um, the teams, um, uh, for your actual projects, but in the first session you were broken up into groups and we tried to, I tried to facilitate a process, or I did facilitate a process of you asking about the other, sharing who you are, what you're studying, but it goes further than that. It goes to, well, if there's a zombie uh, horde coming your way and if you're stranded in um, a cabin, what do you do? That gives further uh, interest into the people that you work with. It shows you who they are, it shows you what their strengths are, what their weaknesses are, it shows you where they're coming from, how they rationalize certain things, and so you need to be able to understand your team and understand what they bring to the table and also what they don't bring to the table. And so in this particular team we see um, there was UX and UI graphics that was brought. Education, somebody else brought education. Someone brought bio, uh, chemical biology. Someone brought humanities. Someone brought social sciences. Now those were just, I think, if I'm not mistaken, those were the areas of study that they found themselves in. Um, but obviously it goes further than that. I mean, language, I, I'm a linguist. I speak Arabic and Hebrew as well. And so language is, uh, is a strength that can be brought to the team. Um, but also speaking to team values. And these were some of the values that they brought or uh, that they uh, wanted to bring to the team. Open communication, that everyone gives effort, that everyone puts in hard work and making sure that they have clarity amongst each other. Now, obviously there was a longer list, but for the sake of making a point, I just chose four. Um, and this gives a wonderful foundation as to where your starting basis is, who you're working with, and who you can rely on. Let's be honest, teamwork is sometimes really difficult. Um, and so mapping all of these out, understanding your team, understanding their values, individual values, but also collective values, gives a good sense as to the working environment you will be, you, you, can, you can either thrive in or not. Now going further into understanding the challenge. Also, I'm noting I might be going too fast, so uh, please let me know if I am. Um, now understanding the challenge even further. <clears throat> Three questions that we could potentially ask when wanting to understand this, this, the, cha the challenge or the situation or the scenario. Which topics or aspects seem to be relevant in the context of your challenge? So I have here on top student productivity app. Now, if I had gone through with my original plan, I would have asked anyone from group five, from Rogue's group, and to respond, well, you know, in terms of a student productivity app, what do you think the main aspects um, would be that would be relevant for you to understand and know and to name um, as, as parts of this challenge? For this particular challenge of early childhood development, um, a relevant aspect was the extension. There needs, to, there needs to be an extension of the program, the extension of that engagement. 
the home environment was a context that was needed to be named for that challenge. The concept or idea of the first thousand days. Um, and usually, and, and this is just something um, that I'm not sure if you're aware of, but the first thousand days are usually the, the um, that a period of time, it's usually the period of time that um, influences how you grow even further after those first thousand of day, those first thousand days. Um, and so if there was neglect in the first thousand days, there will be issues um, after that. Um, you, and you will experience that even into adulthood if you were not fed correctly. Um, and so that's why they focus on the first thousand days. And then also child development seemed to be a relevant topic or context or aspect that they wanted to bring into this challenge and mention and name. Um, I want to also just note that Bill Keese had written, the way you frame your challenge is very important. The way a challenge is framed can either limit or spark creativity. Thank you for that. That was a really wonderful insight as well. Um, Bill Keese, just so that you know, has also done the, um, the, the D school training. Um, and so, completely acknowledge and accept and welcome any other input from Bill Keese. Um, but she has a really good point and she, makes it, and she makes a really good point. How you frame your challenge, how you frame this part is really important because it will either kill your process or give extra oomph to your process. Lindo Kuchle has a question. I see a hand raised. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I have a question. Uh, it's just a side question, not related to the content. I'm just asking, is, is it possible to release these slides in the PDF format or send it to us so that they're accessible as we go through the challenge? Yes. Thanks no, completely. So obviously, no, yes. Yeah. No, thank you for that question as well. A really wonderful question and important. Um, again, I don't have any ownership of any of these, um, this content. It's not mine. There's a Creative Commons license. It belongs to D School. And so we'll be able to condense everything into maybe a two page, three pager, um, and for you to have these questions and to be able to go through it. Because I note that you can't, I mean, taking all of these questions down now is a, it's the hectic and just a lot. And so I would rather you be, you be with the process and go through these questions and speak through it than to, for you to be jotting down everything as, as the sites continue. So we will, be able to, um, we will be able to release something. Um, so Batandwa asked, what is meant by stakeholders? We'll get to that in the next slide. Um, so just to continue, oh wait, it's, it's being asked there, but we'll go further into that in the next slide as well. Um, which key users and stakeholders have you identified? Now, key users and stakeholders are those who are all invested in your situation, in your challenge, in your project, in whatever it is. Now, a user will be people who are on the outside, you're presenting or creating something for them. Stakeholders is uh, any peoples that you're bringing in within the realm of your challenge or in the realm of your, of your, um, of your project. And so here in this case, the primary caregiver mother is a user and stakeholder, field worker or volunteers are, are stakeholders or you, I mean, a user can be a stakeholder as well. But also what if they wanted to engage with you know, government, what if they wanted to engage with um, universities? Those will all be stakeholders, not necessarily users, but stakeholders who are part, who, who, whom you are bringing into the process and who will, who will be with you in that process. Um, next question, what was controversial or surprising? Now, this is also an interesting question. Usually when we are engaging and thinking through what the challenge is, we don't usually, are, we, if something controversial, something surprising pops up, it's usually a situation where we respond, oh, didn't know that, but let's move on. 
um, there's not much effort or not much uh, light that's shed on this controversial or surprising um, aspects of your challenge. Now, those controversial or surprising aspects are sometimes can, or most times, um, can be incorporated and should be incorporated into your um, into your process. Because again, there are certain lenses that we have when we see the challenge, and there are certain things that we just don't see, and so these controversial, surprising things will pop up, and it's for us to note this and for us to accept and document and take it in because it could potentially change your uh, end goal or your end product or your end service or um and so in this case talking about childhood development they found that it was surprising that the program only lasted six months and so the center had a program to uh, to engage with childhood development they didn't know as people's coming into this challenge that it only lasted six months they also didn't know that one program was only one program was being run and 70 percent of the children who are part of this program aren't in crash and they also found that there was a lack of empathy in the center in holding the students the, ch the children engaging with the children um, or even whether the children had access to the center or not Still a part of the empathize. So far, we've just been discuss discussing to, uh, the empathize stage. <clears throat> um, we're wanting to understand what the observation, the, understand the observations that you made. So in terms of users and stakeholders, we want you to document who, with whom did you speak? Who did you speak with? In this case, it was field workers, volunteers, mothers, primary caregivers. AHA, aha. What was surprising or contradicting? They found that the community is interested. However, there was no compensation for volunteers, even though there are volunteers. And so this for them was something Pardon me, so this for them was something that was important. Um, it was important to note, I'm just having a bit of a technical issue this side. Um, I'm just hoping that people can still hear. Cool. Um, and then also. Oh, are we in groups again? No, you shouldn't be. Um, are we still with each other? Just to check in. Yes, we can hear now. Okay, I, I do apologize for that. I'm not entirely sure what is happening. Um, Sorry, um, I, I can hear you now. Um, I, I was muted, like audio and, and um, sound. I, I just went to get some lunch. Nda, can you hear me? 
Oh, it seems to actually yeah, it in like hey, man. I seem to have been kicked out. Please just give me a moment while I try to sort this out. Okay. Oh, interesting. Oh, okay. Well, um, no, I, th I think is he's back. And he's. Yeah, I'm here. I'm here. I, I just I seem to have some technical issue. I again, I do apologize for this. No problem. Um, I'm just kind of trying to get okay. back in with the with the uh, the the other account. Um, Okay, I should, and I should be in. Um, okay, I'm just going to reshare. Re cool, we're with each other, we're good? Yeah. Amazing. Thank you for your patience and just allowing me to sort this out. Um, and so also, understand, yeah, thank you so much. So also understanding observations. We have wanting to look at the underlying needs. What may your user wish or desire? Um, so in, in, if we have a look on top, we have Magneto, SAPs, Records and Organization Demo. What are, the organ, uh, what are their needs and desires? What do they wish for? What are they needing to be solved through you approaching this particular challenge? In terms of the uh, uh, early childhood development, the, the needs or desires were food, security, training, and compensation. And then also context or insight. What has this need not been met? How, why, sorry, why has this need not been met yet? So you need to also take a step back and ask yourself, well, am I the only one who's, who's engaging with this project? Has someone done this before me? What have they done? How successful has that been? Um, how can I look at what they've done and potentially improved on that? Or is their project or, 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 or the service or product so bad? <laughs> um, that we just scrap everything and we start again. You need to also be able to have a look at the context insight. Why has this not been met? What's wrong? What's going wrong in the society? What's going wrong in that particular community? What is not being addressed in that community that requires you to do or to engage with this challenge and for you to do it? Now, in this particular context in early childhood development, they found that there was a hierarchy of power dynamics. Capacity was an issue. There was a lack of funding and bureaucracy stopped all projects from really uh, flourishing. Those are the context insights that they had. And this particular mapping, this aha mo these aha moments and seeing what was surprising or contradicting, uh, looking at users and stakeholders, underlining needs, underlining context. This mapping really gives you an amazing starting point and insight into centering someone, um, their point of view to move forward and to address the issue and to engage. Now, what was this point of view? Usually, um, and from, as we move to the define stage, um, in the define stage, we synthesize information, if you go on top, we synthesize information and define unique problem focus from users' perspectives. So we've engaged with all of these different stakeholders, with these users, we have context insight. We've, we've uncovered aha moments, or we've realized aha moments. We've uncovered certain things which were contradictory or surprising that people don't usually talk about. These um, questions, the, this mapping is all to um, give you a picture of what the situation is and how to potentially move forward. And so with all of those peoples that you've engaged with, 
with all of those interviews, you usually have one person um, to center your, proce your process and your project with around. And you usually start with the how might we. How might we is a really a wonderful starting to it because it allows for something to happen. So the how indicates that there's going to be action. The might uh, gives you a sense of possibility. And the we talks of a collective. So this how might we allows you to move forward with an act collective action that could potentially, will potentially solve the problem. So in terms of a walking, running trail application, that is, this, that is the context you're dealing with. That's the brief that you have. But you really need to ask yourself, well, then what is the action? What is the challenge here? You know, what is the issue? What is, what is the context? Who are the peoples? Who are the stakeholders? Is there anything that I don't know about these one, two, three, four, five words put together that gives me an image of something? So take that challenge, take that, that, that scenario, and flip it into a how might we dot, dot, dot. So in the early childhood development case, this is their point of view, their defining point of view statement. It was, how might we help Thelma and Linda empower primary caregivers to make use of available resources and help them feel ownership in a resource-scarce environment where the program feels top-down? Now, note it was the how might we, and so that's how we start. There's an action word, help, assist, um, promote. There's an action word, and then there's people, because we're humanizing this process, right? And so Thelma and Linda would have obviously been two individuals, probably a part of the center, maybe as volunteers, um, and they would have come with anecdotes. They would have come with experiences. They would have come with insight to that interview. And so we're wanting to help Thelma and Linda what are they going to do? Empower primary caregivers to make use of available resources and help them feel ownership in a, a resource scarce environment where the program feels top down. It tells me about bureaucracy. It tells me about the um, Ill -resour Ill resourced in environment. It tells me about the fact that there are other primary caregivers. Um, it tells me that there are resources, but are they readily available? That's the question. And so we're centering Thelma and Linda and their experience, their point of view, their insight. And every, as we move forward now, we'll always be thinking about Thelma and Linda. And as we move to the ideate phase. So now we know Thelma and Linda are our peoples that we will be working with, that we have in our mind. We probably have an image of them, not only do we have an image of them, but we have a context, we have a region, we have an age, we have a gender, we have a work, we have all of these different aspects of them that now come to the forefront when we're thinking about um, whom we're developing this uh, for. So this ideate phase here, if you have a look at the top right hand corner, we're generating many creative ideas to solve the user's problems. Here you're needing to have fun and anything goes. Now I'll read you some of the ideas that they've given, quite conservative-ish, very standard, but maybe for that particular context, it's not. But the fact that these are ideas tells you that this hasn't happened yet, that it doesn't exist, that it's in, in their line of work, they haven't come across Across developing the program to this extent. And so usually it's rapid fire and we say, <clears throat> um, you know, I would usually say take sticky notes or take small pieces of paper and a cookie and whatever comes to mind, just write. Ideal number one, this is what it is. Number two, this is what it is. Number three, this is what it is. It can be as far-fetched um, 
it can be out of this world, it can be something that maybe doesn't even exist yet, put it on paper. It's content, it's ideas, it's worth something. And usually this is also a fun process when you are with your group. And so, you know, get together, have pizza, or a, 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 whatever food you prefer. Uh, maybe it's vegan pizza, I don't know. <laughs> um, and, you know, get everyone comfortable, hand out pieces of paper, and start popcorning. You know, when you popcorn, everyone's together. Whatever people, whatever comes to mind, you just say it and you write it down. Um, and you do it as a collective. You, and you feed on people's ideas. And so somebody says one thing and it leads you to think of something else, write it down. Um, this particular process is quite fun. I, I personally enjoy it. Um, and it's really something that allows you to, to test yourself, to challenge yourself with, am I thinking in a box? Or am I wanting to, I don't condone arson, but am I wanting to burn this box down and maybe, you know, not even think that, they, that, they, that a box exists. Now, on top it says number seven, Mystique online art gallery platform. Now again, I would have asked, what are some of the ideas um, that you would have come across uh, or that you would think about when thinking of an online art gallery platform? Um, do you know, what does that experience like? What does that look like? How does that look like? Is it on your phone? Do you put on goggles? Do you, <clears throat> you know, basically the world is your oyster of ideas. Um, in, the, in relation to this particular uh, group that I've noted, um, a community garden was an idea. I mean, it sounds simple and plain, but for that context, probably a radical idea. A rewards system um, is another idea, like instituting a reward system for allowing there to be um, engagement in the homes. Creating a father program. Now noting that these are two women who are engaging here and they're wanting to empower other primary caregivers best believe, or we can safely assume, that the majority of these caregivers are women. And so how do we get uh, men involved? Create a father program, have them be a part of this process. Local businesses involved get, I mean, if funding's an issue, can contact businesses, engage with those stakeholders. Those are relevant and important stakeholders that could make or break your product or your service. Focusing on skills development as well. Creating spaces to upskill primary caregivers so that they can do their jobs to the best of their abilities, but also so that they feel a part of a process, that they feel as if they, that the center is investing directly in them. And the one thing that you, if you have a business or if you're part of a schooling system or wherever you are and you are a subordinate, the worst feeling is when your boss or whoever doesn't think you're capable of doing the job or they don't even invest time and effort into, um, into you to be able to do the job even better. And so to make your, your peoples feel a part of the this, this space, invest in skills development. And this is, what they, this is one of the ideas that they had put forward. <clears throat> now, prototyping. We're wanting to understand the prototyping. Also just, I'm just gonna pause there as well. Are there any questions so far? Just so that I, I want to just give time as well to just questions. Sorry. Yes. Can we have maybe a five minutes comfort break? Um, sure. I mean, I will give this over to Bill Keys, Bill Keys, or, or Jonathan. Um, any? Yeah. I mean, uh, how how much time do you think we're gonna be kind of having remaining? 
Well, it's about. It's it so bad. Why did I... <laughs> um, how, how, how long do you estimate the workshop will continue for? Um, another maybe 10 minutes, 7 to 10 minutes. Okay, well, no. Gonna, if it's like that, like, then we can continue. I think we can do that last push, yeah. I think we have, yeah, everyone can We can that. continue. I thought okay. there was a lot of content to cover. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. No, we're, I mean, we're, we're at the last two stages, and then there's just two more slides of just takeaways, mm -hmm. certain things that I'd like you to know. And if there are any questions after that, we'll open up there. But we're in, we're in the last phase of this, don't worry. Okay, no, thanks a lot. I mean, just sign up, but you're, you're wanting a, a break. I, I've been speaking for the last hour or so. <laughs> so I think I, I would be in favor of that break, but it's my last push. Um, so just understanding the prototype, right? And here we're wanting to build, a tan uh, build tangible um, idea prototypes. So from the stage of the rapid fire ideation process, the question is, well, which ideas do you want to take further? Usually it's five, usually it's three ideas. And we move to a prototype, oops. We move to a prototyping phase where we start building. And in this phase, again, you can do anything. I, I'm trying to remember what I proposed I said you can use online platforms um, to, uh, to put things together. Um, you can use Lego to build your prototype. You can use sticks, you can use paper, paper mache. Be creative. It doesn't have to be right. It doesn't have to be correct. It doesn't have to be perfect. It's not supposed to be perfect. It's a draft. The point of this is for you to go to your peoples that you had interviewed and to get feedback. As much as there needs to be a, vi be a visual representation, and I didn't um, add the images because I don't think I, I, I had um, access to those images, so I, don't, I didn't feel comfortable using the images from the, the project. Um, but I, I felt as if I could just use their text and, and just take certain parts of their text. It's visual and the textual. Create something tangible that people can play with, people can feel, people can experience. But also for those who are touchy-feely, have a text. And so what they created, and maybe as I'm reading this, think of it, think of what this could potentially look like in your head. Um, and, and what comes to mind. So maybe close your eyes. And as I'm reading, um, think of what physical, you know, what tangible thing this comes to. The prototype was the veggie garden was the focal point, a place for primary caregivers to gather share and tend to the garden and social and intellectual and for social and intellectual sim stimulation. The reward system in partnership with other businesses were created and, and proposed. Um, and this was the, to acknowledge and appreciate active participation for moral incentives. And there's also an acknowledgement pro ceremony for morale and motivation. Now, now those are just three aspects of their prototype. And there was a bit more, there was a bit more text, but they had a veggie garden, which is something physical. They also had a reward system that they plotted out as a, as a, 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 a diagram and for people to go through this diagram. And also um, there was a, a proposal of an, uh, an acknowledgement ceremony, an awards ceremony to acknowledge what people have done, had done. Um, and so that, some of these things are tangible, some, like a garden is something that you can feel, but for a ceremony, what is that? And so they represented that with Lego, with paper, with um, magnets, with glue, with all of these things, they represented all of this because this was a part of it, this was their prototype, this is what they were putting forward. And they wanted people to experience that in its entirety. Now, once they've done their prototype, it's the testing phase. Questions that we can ask about the testing phase. Was the prototype feasible or, or unfeasible? And were there any adjustments that were needed? So this is what we're looking for when the testing process comes. And here they said, we interviewed uh, Nontem Biso and co-created a solution around, around the rewards system. Another question, in the testing phase, 
having people experience this, were there any issues? They found that space was an issue, garden equipment was an issue, so they didn't take that into consideration when proposing a garden. The cohesion of ideas, the fact that there was a reward system, um, a garden, and then also um, an acknowledgement ceremony was somewhat separate. They did, it didn't come together that well. And also they had an issue with electronic accessibility. And so having people have access to electronics basically, to maybe if it was a reward system on your phone, did people actually have um, an Android or whatever these high tech new phones are where you can have an application to do those types of things. And also asking for recommendations for improvements. Here they said, we discussed the possibility of distributing seeds to several gardens inside people's homes. We spoke about the, de uh, about the Department of Agriculture's involvement. So someone had spoken about um, stakeholders. They didn't mention a name as uh, the Department of Agriculture as a stakeholder. Upon going through the prototyping and testing of this prototype, they realized maybe we should get the government involved. Maybe there's something there that will be able to assist in funding, assist in skills development, that would take away from um, the need for creating other uh, programs to assist. Um, and lastly, they had gone through this process, they asked these questions and if there were any issues and um, what worked, what didn't work, were there any further suggestions? And iteration is a part of the process. You always go back to define and develop. And they went back and actually decided to focus on someone else. And so Nom Tembiso, who you saw here, um, where they, Nom Tembiso was one of the interviewees that initially they did not focus on. They thought, well, you know, we should actually focus on this reward system. Maybe there's something there. So they went back to the interview. They reiterated. They went back to the um, empathize stage and continued. And they refocused their defining uh, the point of view statement by the name. But not only this name. And so, it so the top is the, the initial point of view statement, the bottom is the reworked, redefined point of view statement. The only difference, so to say, is the name. So it's how, how might we help Nom Tembiso empower primary care workers, caregivers, to make use of available resources and help them feel ownership in a resource scarce environment where the program feels top down. Now, even though on text, we just see a different name, Nom Tembiso was the one that spoke about the reward system. And by focusing on Nom Tembiso, their final goal was an amplification and introduction and amplification of that reward system as a part of the final product. And so the final solution was at the end of the whole process, and this is the end, the final solution, usually we ask, we look for what is the final solution about, the list, the features and benefits. We look at whom is this final solution for, what were the improvements, and are there any open questions and possible next steps. So with the first block, the final solution we, and the benefits we see, there was now a reward system which was at the center. We have an award ceremony which acknowledges volunteers, and the possibility to employ more volunteers. That's what they now focused on. The garden was out. They went back, let go of the garden, and refocused their whole project on the reward system because that gave more incentive for people to do this type of care giving work at home and to allow home spaces to be used as remote spaces for, of this, uh, as extensions of the center. Whom is the solution for? And they said early, uh, early, sorry, early child care development volunteers, ECD participants, which were the moms, and community workers. 
And always note that your, your solution is not final. You'll, there's always a next step. There's, someone's always going to come and say, oh, I can make this even better. And so we're always open to, well, you know, are there any other questions that, I mean, even though we have a final product, are there any further questions that we still have? Or is there anything, are there any further steps that we could potentially take? And the questions that they had proposed was, how can we expand the garden project and other community volunteer projects? So they still felt as if the garden project was something worthwhile, but it wasn't something that they wanted to focus on at this moment in time. It's something that can come later. The next was considering employing more community workers. That's something that they addressed as a, as a potential further need. And then also just marketing of the program. How could we market this more efficiently? And so this is just a breakdown of it again. This is the process we followed. This is the process that I've been speaking about. Ignore the 20 minutes. Um, this is the process that um, I had explained. We have the empathize, define, ideate, prototype, and test. And to note that there are questions we're asking underneath those stages or phases, but what we do and uh, to answer those questions, it's really up to you. The way you ideate, the way you want to define, how you empathize or how you investigate, how you um, how you um, connect getting insights, what type of prototypes you're wanting to build. It's really up to you. So I'm going to, there's the reflect and share and check out. Usually here I would ask, are there any questions? Are there any feelings? Are there any responses? Do people think this is worthwhile? Do people think that this is not worthwhile? For me coming in, it's to provide another way of seeing design thinking. Um, and whether you use this or not, it's, it's really up to you. I think any process is worth looking into, but how you um, operationalize it, how you use it, it's up to you. I have two more slides of takeaways, and then maybe we can just close with the, for my side, close with any responses. And then I will hand over to, um, to Jonathan or Bill Keys. If anything, please walk away with the following. And these are the takeaways. Design thinking starts with empathy. It's a human focus, it's a deep human uh, focus. Um, sorry, let me start that again. Design thinking starts with empathy a deep human focus in order to gain insights that may reveal new and unexplored ways of seeing and courses of action to follow in bringing about preferred situations for business and society or whoever else that is for you. It involves reframing the perceived problem or challenge at hand and gaining perspectives which allows a more holistic look at the path towards the preferred situations. It encourages collaborative, multidisciplinary teamwork to leverage the skills, personalities, and thinking styles, emphasis on skills, personalities, and thinking styles of many in order to solve multifaceted problems. So if you have a grouping of people and you're all in the same department, please branch out, get other ways of thinking. Humanities, is, has a different way of thinking to medicine, which has a different way of thinking to engineering. Initially, uh, it initially employs divergent styles of thinking. So we go out, we explore um, as many possibilities as we can. We defer judgment. We don't care what people say. We're interested in what they're saying, if that makes sense. We don't care how they're saying it, what they're saying. We're wanting to know what is it that they are saying. Whether we have a, a, a personal resonance with that or not is irrelevant. And we're creating open ideation spaces to allow for maximum number of ideas and points of view to surface. And so we open up to uh, different possible solutions. It later employs a convergent style of thinking to isolate potential solution streams, uh, combining and defining insights and more mature ideas, which have a path forward. 
So once we explore, we see what people say, we come in and we get that point of view. We go out and we diverge um, and we see what ideas we can use. We come in and we focus on one or two or three. It encourages an, uh, in early explorations, uh, sorry, it engages in early exploration of selected ideas, rapidly modeling potential solutions to encourage learning while doing, and allow for gaining additional insight into the viability of solutions before too much time and money has been spent. And this is something that I want to also just like note. Don't, when you are creating your prototypes, don't put money to it. Don't go and splurge and invest so much time, energy, and capital in this for it to potentially not be a success. Keep it plain, keep it simple, but effective. Tests and prototypes which survive the processes further, um, uh, further to remove any potential issue. So we go and test, we define, iterate through various stages, revisiting empathetic frames of mind, and then redefining the challenge as new knowledge and insight, and insight is gained along the way. And lastly, it starts off chaotic and cloudy, streamrolling towards points of clarity until a desirable, feasible, and viable solution emerges. So it's going to be a messy, uh, a messy process. Be with that mess, but trust the process. And so I'll end here. Um, I will, if there are questions, I know it is three o'clock if I'm not mistaken, on the dot. Yes, it's three o'clock on the dot. If there, no. are any, if there are any questions, we can maybe give five, 10 minutes to questions. If not, I really thank you for the opportunity to have done this, to go through this. I apologize for that technical glitch earlier on, um, but I'm hoping from my part, I'm hoping that there's something worthwhile in this process that you can use in order to create amazing things in the world because definitely we need better solutions to the problems we have. Um, yeah, I will pause there. If there are questions, I, I welcome them. Does anyone have any questions? Let's see. Mm -hmm. Okay, it seems there aren't any questions. Um. Thank you very much. Yeah, on behalf of the club, I'd like to say thank you so much for your time. It was very insightful um, and beneficial for future development of applications. Um, and just for introducing us to new ways of thinking. When I see you, Uzaid, definitely I'm ready with a Lynn chocolate. <laughs> 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 yeah, I, I, I welcome that as well. <laughs> no, yeah, uh, no, thank, it, 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 thank you so much for your time, um, for both sessions that you put so much effort into. Everyone's definitely learned something. And I think, yeah, for everyone who's attended today, um, you know, clap privately for the, for, for Izzy for, for their help. Um, and on top of that, if, if you're part of a team that's currently working on a project and you maybe don't have team members here today, please, please, please convey the information to them. Please suggest that they look at the recordings. And for everyone else that's here, um, I'm gonna give you the link to the sign up, I mean, to the feedback form right now. And I would really appreciate if you, yeah, just give some feedback so that all of us can take that to heart and um, iterate and, and design a, a, a better new and improved workshop in the future if there was anything that you didn't enjoy. But I was thoroughly satisfied, to, so thank you. Thank you. Amazing, thank you. And then also, um, just in terms of sharing content, I think we will work through either Jonathan or Bill Keys um, just to disseminate that. Um, and so, yeah, we'll have an offline conversation about that. Okay, okay. Cool. Yeah, thank, thank you. you so much. Okay.
Oh, ja, 